Hello, hello, everyone. Welcome. I'm just going to give a minute here for everyone to join us. So welcome all. And thank you for joining Women's Way for the Closing the Gender Wealth Gap Forum, Incarceration as Wealth Extraction. And I see people are joining us as they come in. Uh, briefly, I'm, I'm Diane Corman-Levy, the Chief Disruptor at Women's Way, and I'm really delighted that you have decided to spend the next 90 minutes with us. When we refer to women, we mean trans and cis women and femme identified people, which includes anyone who is not a trans or cis woman, but who also identifies as feminine and also those who identify as gender expansive, non-binary and or gender non-conforming. So again, welcome, welcome. While we wait for folks to sign on, I would appreciate you taking the poll. We wanna know if this is the first time attending a Women's Way event and the poll hopefully will show up on the screen. There it is. So if you could just answer that question, if this is the first time attending a Women's Way event, we would greatly appreciate it. So today's forum is part of a year long series whose purpose is to educate different stakeholders about the drivers of the gender wealth gap and action steps each of us can take to help close the gender wealth gap. Since October, 2020, when we launched the series, we have conducted 23 forums that address different drivers of the gender wealth gap, such as strengthening the early childhood education sector, decreasing gender and racial disparities in healthcare, increasing access to affordable housing, promoting equity and grant making, and eliminating the student debt crisis. Today's session will explore stories and insights from our Change the Narrative Fellows, who will discuss the connection between the gender wealth gap and the strategies of exploitation and extraction implemented in the criminal legal system. Fellows will reflect on their experiences making Beyond the Razor Wire Fence, a podcast about their stories, which is available to stream on all platforms. You will also have opportunities to ask questions to the speakers via the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen. We will do our best to answer as many questions as possible. Closed captioning is enabled. If you do not want to see closed captioning, you can click hide CC at the bottom of your screen. The chat is also enabled, so please share your comments during the session to create a safer space for all of us to engage in honest and challenging discussions. We do ask each of you to abide to the session norms listed in the chat box. Finally, we will record the session and make it available to you to view again for those who could not attend today's session. After the session, you will, we will also send you a list of resources related to today's topic and a survey to evaluate the session. We really deeply evaluate your input as we work to continually improve these educational forums. So before we introduce you to the panelists and moderator, I'm very excited about um, this session. I first want to thank our session sponsor, Wiston and Strong, Strong uh, for their generous support. And uh, Kelly Shear, the, the director of the, well, actually, she's the director of the Gender Wealth Institute. She's also our chief impact, chief strategy officer. <laughs> and I are going to spend the next few minutes providing an overview of the economic state of women and children, why Women's Way is investing its resources into addressing the gender wealth gap and key concepts re related to the gender wealth gap. So for those who don't know us, we were the first umbrella fu funding federation in the United States, specifically dedicated to women's issues. We've been around for about 46 years and we are a gender justice organization whose mission is to achieve gender equity by building collective power to disrupt systems of oppression and strengthen alternative models centered in love, liberation, and inclusion. I'm gonna briefly talk about the economic state of women, which has not been good and has not really improved a lot um, over, over the last few years. 80% of workers in the United States are living paycheck to paycheck, and most of them are women. And 47% of Americans are not able to cover an unexpected $400 expense. And again, majority are women. Unfortunately, Philadelphia still has the highest poverty rate among the 10 largest cities. And it's actually dropped to about 22%, but we're, it's dropped, but we still have the highest poverty rate in the region's largest demographic group living in poverty are women ages 25 to 34. 
we're going to talk a little bit about the gender wealth gap and which is larger than the pay equity gap. I think a lot of people know about the pay equity gap, but the gender wealth gap is even more indicative of the inequities, the economic inequities that many women and gender expansive folks experience. Related to the gender wealth gap is the retirement gap, where they're projecting that 80% of women are likely to be living in poverty by age 65. And if these current trends continue, we will not see gender parity until about 2133. And that is way too long. So what is the gender wealth gap? This shows how the wealth gap between non-Hispanic white men not, and, and non-Hispanic white women, Hispanic women and non-Hispanic black women. If you look at this visual, single white women own 56 cents on the dollar compared to single white men. If you go down to Hispanic women, they only own 10 cents and non-Hispanic black women own five cents. And so this gender wealth gap has been around for a long time and has actually gotten worse over the last few years. So at Women's Way, and there's a lot of causes about this, and one of, we'll talk about that a little bit, particularly in relation to the carceral system. But we really, at Women's Way, we're really committed to creating an inclusive, equitable economy. And this requires a new bold vision for our economy, which really provides solutions to centuries of systemic exclusion, extraction, and exploitation, which has continually undermined our, the economic potential in our country. So we started something called the Gender Wealth Institute a few years ago, and our, and our vision is to close the gender wealth gap in the greater Philadelphia region by advancing research and practical solutions that build wealth for women. And this was built on a strong foundation of our work over the last eight years, where we worked with over 100 partners to figure out what are the root systemic causes of gender economic inequities, and what do we need to do to really move the needle to transform systems so that all women and gender expansive folks can thrive. I'm now gonna pass this on to my partner in crime, Kelly Sheard. Great, thank you. First, we wanna begin by centering our definition of wealth pioneered by our friends at the Maven Collaborative. When wealth is accumulated, we live and retire with greater dignity, freedom, and peace of mind. Our communities are prosperous, resilient, and vibrant. Future generations have the freedom to dream big and become all they truly can be. And we are healthy and know that our families, networks, and communities are healthy, spiritually whole, and contributing. Next slide. It's important to start here because we want to move the conversation beyond individual economic stability heard a little echo. Um, if you are not a pan, thank you. Um, we wanna move the conversation beyond individual economic stability and the possession of financial assets. Both of these concepts are important, but often not enough to encompass the lived experience of abundance that we seek to build. We also wanna start by stating our theoretical framework for how race and gender interplay in the expression of power, as well as how our current economic system functions. Consider these points are key concepts. Next slide. First, a brief primer on racialized capitalism. We understand capitalism to be the private ownership of property where one class of people control and profit from the labor of the subordinate class. The social structure of capitalism reflects a system of relationships of domination among categories of people. The subordinate class is necessarily racialized and the dominant class is white. As it relates to capitalism, whiteness is institutional, collective and cumulative, and has little to do with individual experiences. It is a structural advantage that confers dominance and causes racialized outsiders to compete to seek the rewards and privileges of whiteness. Next slide. Wealth supremacy helps us understand why we exist in an economic system that believes wealthy people matter more than others. This concept refers to cultural and political processes and attitudes 
by which the wealthy accumulate and maintain prestige, power, and privilege, as well as how wealth is protected and grown by the privileged class. It's about the myths of extraction and exploitation that drive hoarding, as well as the systems design that reflect the valuation and protection of that extreme hoarding. Next slide. Finally, heteropatriarchy is a logic that justifies the subordination of all those who are not heterosexual cisgender men. The civilizing projects of a gender binary, along with the construction of heterosexuality as normative, serve the interests of the dominant. Anything outside of the constructed norm is seen as deviant and unworthy, and therefore oppression becomes justified. There is an ethos of meritocracy in the system designed to protect the interest of the dominant. These are brief primers on three concepts that we feel are important. Of course, this does not encompass every idea worth mentioning, but instead offer a framework to understand how we get to dangerous outcomes like the gender wealth gap. Next slide. Today's topic shifts to explore how incarceration functions as a form of wealth extraction. We're excited to welcome panelists from our Changing the Narrative Fellowship Program. Through the fellowship, we want to examine carceral culture, or more specifically, the norms, attitudes, practices, and standards that shape and characterize the prison experience, as well as structures of punishment, surveillance, and confinement. We examine incarceration as a system, not only because women are entering jails and prisons at a faster growth rate than men, but to also illustrate how various systems work to perpetuate the gender wealth gap. The systems contributing to wealth gaps are not just those in the financial industry. We highlight the carceral system as a way to emphasize the narratives and nuance that prop up wealth and inequity in a variety of contexts. Next slide. In the carceral system's various methods of sentencing and correction, policies and practices serve to destabilize those caught in the web. Methods intended on its face to deter future crimes and rehabilitate offenders instead function to dominate, oppress, and squelch out potential, opportunity, and dignity. Next slide. Our goal in the fellowship was to do important narrative work highlighting the rules and norms of society that lead to incarceration as wealth extraction. We believe it's important to provide visibility and awareness to stories that are often silenced, lost, and erased. The stories of the fellows on this panel are both singular and collective, experienced by each individual, but often illustrating a dangerous and harmful pattern that deepens the gender wealth gap. Ultimately, our hope is that these stories are woven together to make meaning and change the culture. Next slide. As with all of our Changing the Wealth Gap narrative, uh, Changing the Wealth Gap series, part of the work of liberation is to uncover the plot, that is the intentions, actions, and outcomes. Next slide. Now I am pleased to introduce our moderator for today's session, LaTanya Myers, founder of Above All Odds. Welcome, LaTanya. Thank you so much, everyone. And I really appreciate, appreciate Women's Way and everybody that's on and that's participating in today's webinar. Um, my name is Latanya Myers. I am a native to Philadelphia. I'm a formerly incarcerated activist, uh, also um, individual that won the first Human Rights Award within Philadelphia um, International Award. I want to take this time to not only thank every one of the panelists and the fellows that took their time to be um, to tell their story. Um, the controller narrative, but also to make sure that we have solutions moving forward in this problem. Um, in 2022, there were 100 
180,648 women incarcerated in the United States, which is 585% increase since, two, um, since 1980. Again, I'm nervous and I apologize, but I want to really leave that with y'all so y'all can understand. In 2023, uh, 22, there was 180,648 women incarcerated in the United States, which is a 585% increase since 1980. The rate of incarcerated women has grown twice as fast as, as men since 1980. And that's why the importance of us being on this call and making sure that those that's the cornerstone of our families and communities, women, that's stories are often um, unheard is important that we amplify. Black and uh, Native American as, as well as um, other, uh, uh, other women um, are um, overpopulated and um, federal prisons. I apologize again for my <laughs> for my for my nervousness, but it's coming out a sense of anxiety because we un understand what we're up against, and I just feel grateful as a moderator to be able to amplify the stories and solutions of all these women on this panel with that. So with that being said, with that being said, first clips uh, we're gonna jump right into is you're gonna hear directly from the fellows that was incarcerated at extraction, extraction meant to them, their family and their community. Please roll a clip. I'm actually going to have all the panelists come on screen and introduce themselves. Okay, that'd be good. I, I apologize again. So if all the panelists that's in the first segment could please um come off, um come on camera and please just make a brief introduction before we go into anything. Thank you, T. Good evening. My name is Jamila W. Harris. My peers know me as Jay. And as a certified forensic peer specialist, I collaborate with various agencies that provide support services to returning women. As a social justice activist and artist, I creatively expound on why the carceral system must be abolished. My latest novel, Black Mother Deleted, is now available on Amazon. I'll share the link before the podcast is over, the webinar. And it dwells further into these reasons why, as well as my personal, my personal journey and how I got introduced to the criminal justice system. I thank everyone for supporting the podcast and joining us this evening. Thank you. Good I'm evening, sorry. everyone. My name is Dr. Victoria Beth. I am a current fellow of the Women's Way um, Gender Gap um, Institute, um, Gender Wealth, Institute. I'm so delighted to be here. Um, I run a nonprofit called Victoria Urban Outreach Tutoring Service that supports youth um, and adults in the city of Philadelphia. I am also a project manager for the data collab within the district attorney's office. In addition, I sit on the board for a nonprofit called SPA, Society to Preserve African American Assets. And lastly, I am here with you all. So with that, I thank you for having me. Um, to, to also just note that my um, podcast is called What I Am Built For, and I hope you all get a chance to check it out. Hi, I'm Pam Superville. My pronouns are she and her. My current position is 
a deputy director in the Office of Reentry Partnerships. Um, I'm happy to be here. I hope this event will educate all of the listeners on issues as it relates to the gender wealth gap and the way it has affected and continues affecting incarcerated women. My episode, which I hope you will pay close attention to, is called Mr. Gender Wealth Gap. Thank you. Okay. Hello, my name is Angie Orozco Rasique. My pronouns are she, her, and I am currently a student at the Community College of Philadelphia, and I work on many initiatives um, around the city. Um, I work as a peer educator. Um, I do a lot of advocacy work, and I'm just super happy to be here with you all today. I'm Monique Taylor. I am a lead outreach worker for Project Home. My population is the opiate epidemic population in Kensington. I am a certified peer forensics and a mental health specialist. Uh, I don't really have much to say. Uh, mental health and substance use disorder and homelessness are not crimes, and I hope to impact uh, the gender wealth gap through those three avenues. And I look, I'm looking forward to having this segment. Sappho Fulton, I um, am the CEO and founder of Women Beyond Borders, Women Spell with an X. And um, I'm also the program manager for King Sesson Heels. I'm the wellness coordinator. And uh, yeah, so I do this work. I do pre-release and um, I do re-entry services. I'm also uh, the coalition co-chair for the Office of Reentry Health Department, uh, Health Committee. I'm sorry, not the Health Department, the Health Committee. And I'm also on the board of uh, Hathi which is a place that provides uh, services to organizations. It's a private foundation that provides uh, funding to organizations that provide housing for homeless people. So I believe in this work. My segment is Collateral Consequences, and um, I'm excited for the conversation this evening. Hello, my name is Ivy Johnson. I am a justice-impacted um psychological first responder. I am a advocate for anti-violence and social justice. I work with frontline dads, mothers in charge, and the Sunset Parole Coalition, soon to be working for Project Home as a as residential service coordinator one. And thank you for having me. My episode is called See Us as Human Beings. Thank you, ladies, so much. Y'all really put me at ease um, seeing y'all confidence and all the amazing things that y'all doing in the city of Philadelphia and throughout. Um, I'm pretty sure that everyone on this call is interested to hear what y'all have to say in regards to uh, all the hard work that y'all put in alongside a uh, woman's way to make sure that y'all issues and the gender wealth gap is being closed and y'all solutions are being heard. Thank you so much, Kelly, for that. I mean, who know our story best than us and who, how can we uh, naturally let y'all know what, what what's going on? I think what quote that just came to mind was Shirley Trism. She said, if we don't have a seat at the table, we got to bring one, a folding chair, right? If we don't got a table to come to, then we got to build one. So my question is um, to Ms. Jamila, I know you've been doing work uh, in the city of Philadelphia, um, countless of times showing up. I just want to know what's your experience with the gender wealth gap and the people that you know that not only yourself, but people in your community, family have been exposed to or things that they have been excluded from to allow them to perpetuate forward in life and not be chained to the mistakes of their past. 
<clears throat> well, to answer the question about how incarceration is a, a wealth gap or how is there a, it's a form of wealth extraction, uh, we can start with the work that you do, Tanya, or with the uh, the Bell Fund. It's a wealth extraction from the rip when you, when a, a individual, a human becomes commodity, becomes ransom. I'm holding this person, your family member, in most cases, the matriarch of your family for a certain amount of money. And then when you follow through, at one point you were only getting a percentage of your bail money back. People were putting up their homes. They were invested. They, they, we we're, were poor. You have a, my loved one in your custody. And so they give up whatever they can for that for that member. But thanks to the work that you were doing, T, uh, you are now able to get 100%. I think in the county of Philadelphia, you're able to get 100% of your bail money back. And in Chicago, they ended cash bail. And you shared that on our podcast episode one, the work that activism and advocacy has done to change the first wealth extraction of you have to pay bail if you want this family member back. Then once you are incarcerated, it's a billion dollars, over a billion dollars annually. And uh, criminal justice is a cash cow where the incarcerated individual is the commodity and the family members are the investors. So now they're paying for phone calls. They got to set up a phone account. That's bill number one. Then they have to pay for putting commissary money in your books. And then they are now making it a policy that if you, if someone puts money on your books and you have restitution or you owe fines and fees, they can take a percentage of that out, which only causes family members to have to put even more money on someone else's books, just so on their family members' books, just so they can buy a bar of soap because the criminal justice system took out 75% of what you gave them. That's bill number two. The postage is not free. I work with Prison Health News. I know they have to, the postage goes up, mailing letters, digital mail, digital mail is not free. That's bill number three. The family member has to set up a digital mail account if they want to speak to their uh, uh, incarcerated loved one. And we know how important the phone is because we need our family members to advocate, to contact our lawyers, to find out what's going on, to get me out of here. But they can't do that without setting up a phone account to be able to talk to you. And then transportation, prisons and jails are not conveniently located near populations. So a visit to a loved one is anywhere from one hour to eight hours long. That's a car that can make it. That's gas money. And community members, they always carpool, but then you have to pay into that, the van service that will take you to go visit your loved one. So I just think four different ways alone, four new bills that family members incur when an incarcerated, when a, when a loved one is incarcerated. When they get research has shown that when an incarcerated individual, when a family member is incarcerated, there is a 22% decrease in their income. And even when they return, there's a 15% decrease in their income. So that means even when that family member returns home, that family is just playing catch up from here on out. And they're never able to prosper and build wealth when they're playing catch up the debt or the money that they put into the business of the criminal justice system. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Miller. And Thank that kind of that leads me into the next question that I wanted to ask, because as we all know, most of the people that are incarcerated, the women that because of the the taking out the man out the home in the 70s and the hyper predatory monitor, the things that was Took them, took the men out the home in the seventies, the eighties. Now we see that it was a five hundred and eighty-five percent increase, right? That we know that most of the people that serve in time in local and state jails are receiving social security benefits. They're receiving disability benefits, or they're receiving some type of public assistance. So there's like a hyper predatory on within a, a, a community of people that's black, brown, and mostly women that's left to raise their kids now and their kids are left by themselves. So my follow-up question is, how has, and this is for Ms. Monique Teller, how has bias and stigma impacted your ability to take care of yourself or the those that come in home and the those that you, that you now serve um, 
and, and within your community to keep them from um having to go through the barriers that were set, set in place in front of you. And again, how has the uh, bias and the stigma impacted your ability to help people, but also okay. impacted your ability to return home and provide the services that you need for people to be successful? Particularly um, when thanks, for the, thanks for the question, T. Um, bias and stigma. It is just like death and a grave. You know, I, uh, being a returning citizen, um, I uh, got introduced into the penal system from my addiction. So when I got into the uh, prison, I started to see more and more women that look like me, black and brown women and other ethnicities, Hispanic, Caucasian, um, affected from this, uh, at that time, uh, it was a different epidemic. Um, it's always an epidemic. So the stigma that gets attached to us is not only are we uh, once an addict, always an addict. Um, I am a, a member of the LGBTQ community. Uh, I am also a recovering uh, substance use, recovering from substance use disorder. I have mental health. I uh, experience homelessness. So I have all these layers that was given to me. And it's hard to take it off. It's hard to support other people. You know how to say it takes one to know one. So like when I'm in my community, because I work in Kensington, I'm no different than them. I just don't use a drug, but I had the same experiences as them. And so the stigma of, oh, if they wanted to go home, they should just go, you know. So like there's, there's people that, like for myself, I feel like Ivy, I wasn't born into um, the gender wealth gap, but I watched it in full effect. Like when my parents separated, I noticed my mom was a single parent. I noticed my mental health came into play and I didn't know how to identify it. So like, you know, in our community, my dad is a Native American. In our community, we don't say those things like, you know, oh, he's crazy. You know, say nothing about him. He's a little off. You know, now mental health is more acceptable. So I'm grateful to be able to be a bridge for somebody to get the services that we need. But the stigma is killing us. The stigma, we have to break down that wall that no, once an addict, always an addict is not true. I'm living proof. You know, I, I am in my, up to my neck. I just got a, a paper in the mail the other day. I owe $10,000 in court costs and fines and restitution and all of that. You know, and I'm struggling just to make ends meet, you know, but I don't go back out and commit a crime again. I join in with other women like Jay and Sappho and Vicky and Miss Pam. And like, we're going to do something about this. We're going to put this into motion. We're not going to be talking, no action. Like we're going to walk the talk, you know, because there are ways that we can you know, bridge this gap. We have to be able to bridge the gap. But the stigma, we gonna, we gonna let that go. We gonna fight that stigma every step of the way. You cannot classify me. I'm a human being, I'm a woman, and I deserve to be heard and treated with dignity and respect. I need to be having a job, take care of my family, be able to save money, be able to feed my kids. When you extract a woman out of her community from her home, everybody's affected. It's not just, oh, my kids, it's my kids, it's my mom, it's my brother, it's my cousin, it's my community. It's my kids' community. It's my grandkids. Like, mm -hmm. it affects the whole community when you take one. Thank you so much, Ms. Monique, for all that you've done. And as far, like, for the, for laying the foundation for generations like mine and those to come, to know that we're not, we're not, this, but we're no longer conforming to that negative stigma um, mm -hmm. that we can't, 
if given a chance, do the right thing. And that we don't want to care for our kids because we aren't, aren't given the opportunities to or a, the livable wage or the means to bring the healing that we need to our communities back to it. And I really, I really, and I deeply appreciate that, Ms. Monique. Ms. Thank Ivy, you. I really wanted to know um, about, you know, your experience with, uh, as as a woman, um, you know, working alongside and um, advocating for a change in your community. And this looks different than what it looked like in the 70s when there was a mass incarceration of men. But like was stated before, there's an increase of incarceration for women. So what are some of the barriers and the challenges that you see faced in front of organizers and you know uh, community leaders of uh, black women like yourself that we can step in and provide more education to know that this is not what's supposed to be happen happening, um, that we need more support and that this is nothing that we should be comfortable or surviving out of, but how can we um, advocate for individuals to lay the foundation for us not to just survive, but to thrive? Oh, thank you for that question, T. One of the greatest bar barriers I faced coming home was the housing issue. Okay, um, and I wanna use this, I wanna use a hundred places to live because that's a good, good round number to start from. If there are a hundred, places to reside and it possibly be for rent. Um, only 17 of them would be willing to rent to me on parole. And many people may say, just don't tell them when you're on parole. Yet a stipulation of parole is that I have to hand the landlord a piece of paper that says they know I'm on parole. So now out of those 20 places that were willing to rent to me, um, only 17 of them would be of less than 17 of them would be livable, habitable. You know, at one point I had water running down my wall. Another time I had a hole in the middle of the uh, ceiling in the living room. Uh, I, You name it. Uh, I had one landlord wanted to change Ms. sex for rent. Miss Ivy, can I ask one question? What an additional barrier to you yourself, but if you have kids or you were separated from your kids, if you was trying to get custody back of your kids to get a stable place to stay, to bring your family back together. Because from my understanding, once you're sentenced to over 24 months um, in Pennsylvania, you're, you're right. You're right. You're right. I don't have children. I don't okay. have children, but you're absolutely right. If you if you serve uh, 12 months, 12 months, and one day your children can go up for adoption. You're absolutely right. I've held women's hands through that, but I don't have children myself. So that wasn't an issue for me. My greatest issue was definitely the housing issue. Understood. And I can understand that alone and then having kids that you want to reconnect with and then yes. you're experiencing these housing barriers, or even if you have nieces and nephews, that you come home that you want to, you know, reconnect with and be that 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 sole provider for your family. Um, well, well, to be to be honest with you, before you even try to get your children back, you have to have stable housing. Exactly. That supersedes even attempting to get your children back. Mm -hmm. You know, so that would be an issue for those women who have children. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Miss Ivy. And I wanted to know. Um, Dr. Sapo, that's on a call, you know, with all the degrees that you've gotten and all the amazing things that you have done within this community and, you know, all the innovative things that you've done, what are some of the barriers that you've seen far as education, um, far as um, reaching back within your community or the support advocating for LGBTQI plus people, um, as well as even just yourself? To, to be seen equal on and, and to be to, to be seen and be heard and on a platform that you can tell your story but also um offer strategies moving forth that we can make sure that other people don't experience the things that we all been through on this call. So thank you for coming to me um and asking me that question. Um I haven't made a list 
of all the barriers that I've encountered. You know, um, from the beginning, I think the biggest challenge for me was even going back to school. You know, I dropped out of school in the eighth grade. I spent over 20 something years in the penal system and um, we had to go upstate. We had to go to school if we didn't have a copy of our GED, you know, and mine was a doubt. And I didn't spend 20 straight years. I spent 20 years in and out of the penitentiary based on mental health and substance abuse usage. So going back to school for me um, and testing in a second grade reading level when I was at Muncie, you know, um, it was all about the drive. It was all about self-determination, you know, the same drive that is born in us. You know, when you go to the penitentiary, they say like, you either going, you either going to live or you going to die. Like you, I choose how you going to go through this. You know, you make a choice from the door. And I don't even say that that's just from an ideology from the penitentiary. It's just like, you know, you're going to let, I think more of the, 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 the language is you're going to do the time or you're going to let the time do you. You know, so it was always about stepping into survival mode, stepping into survival mode. And the drive is just in my nature. You know, um, it hasn't been easy. It hasn't been easy because the thing that happens, you know, I like to talk stuff. I'm a, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a crap talk. I like to, you know, I like to talk stuff, you know, talk things. And that's my defense mechanism. But the reality of it is, it's like fear sets in so bad because I've been incarcerated so long. I'm terrified. I don't know how to read the whole application. I don't know what I'm signing. I'm messed up from being incarcerated. The, the, the My segment is collateral consequences. I have said on multiple occasions, I'll take the plea deal. Just let me out. I ain't even had nowhere to go. But I was like, just let me out. You know, and, and, and that's the, the ideology that they pushed through. And, and at that time, that's what they were pushing when the public defender, they'd be like, I hope you ain't got no public defender. You know what I mean? And and, and that was then. Um, I can't say now because I don't want I don't want to get in no trouble. But I know that for a long time, you know, and then you would get these high sentences. I mean high um stipulations. So I want to say, like going back to school, you know, as a at 42, you know, I was in 098, 099, and, and I couldn't comprehend a paragraph. You know, I couldn't I couldn't write a full sentence without a run on sentence. So a but lot of the programs, staying, excuse me, that didn't stop I, me from staying. Wait a minute, no, one second. That didn't stop me from staying in the library until nine o'clock at night or going to the learning center to get support. Do you understand? So I'm sorry, go ahead. No, I just wanted to ampl uh, amplify with, with what you are saying, and I don't mean to cut you off. Please continue. Um, I just wanted to the importance of education programs because it's different from men returning home than it is for women, correct? Um, you don't get that same camaraderie sometimes. Um, it, I mean, the programs that's available is tend to gear to warehouse jobs or welding. Um, a lot of people are trying to weave their family back together. A lot of female identifying people, matriarchs of their family are trying to weave their family back together. Um, and I, I just wanted to amplify the importance. What you said was education and individualized programs like William, uh, like Woman's Way um, that's providing us to have the space for us. And I think we're doing amazing, ladies, like, to be honest. And like, I just look up to y'all and technical difficulties. Um, I just want to say that what we are doing is we're laying the foundation for the next generation. And I think that's exactly uh, what Ms. Pam is doing at the Office for Reentry in the city of Philadelphia. Um, and I, I just wanted to know about a little bit about what efforts um, that you have um, implemented and what other support that you may need and what William uh, Woman's Way have um, provided you with a platform to tell your story, but also um, advocate so that we can get the support and resources needed so that we are not making, that we again are not uh, making sure that the generations of, uh, that's coming after us doesn't have to go through what we went through prior to us or now. So Ms. Pam, could you tell me about the amazing work that you're doing? I mean, this is one of the first 
office of reentry <laughs> and like Philadelphia's history that you're leading and as a woman, um, how did that feel and how did going through um women's way um really connected you with the gender wealth gap and understanding of the importance of the more support and resources needed for women coming home in the city of Philadelphia? Thank you so much for the question. Um I'm in my role here as deputy director for um, the Office of Reentry Partnerships. My role, my current role, I have oversight for the Philadelphia Reentry Coalition, which is now an organization that I've seen grown in about an eight month time from about 80 something members to 209 members. But prior, prior to doing um, having this role, I've worked in reentry, I've been home for about 15 years, and I've worked in reentry for most of those 15 years. And what my dedication to this work is, and will always be, is continuing to advocate for more gender specific service for women who are coming home. I mean, I see people, men and women coming home. You ask a man, one of my biggest stories that I'll take to my grave, you ask a man coming home, how could we help you in reentry? He says, help me get a job and help me get a home. You ask a woman, a sister coming home, she's going to say, ma'am, help me to become whole, help me to reconnect with my children, and help me to really overcome the stigma of my incarceration. And this is something that is overlooked time and time again by almost every individual, every jurisdiction, every most reentry programs. We do not focus on the needs of the women who come from behind the razor wire fences. So I advocate, I mean, I help people with, you know, job readiness, how to get the mental health help you need, the drug and addiction help you need, how to actually go into an office because I use my life as a story. I came home with nothing. And it's because of the support. And like Safo just said a little while ago, because it's either you make it or break it. It's either you let you do the jail or the jail do you. So coming home, I was determined that I was going to succeed and use my story coming home with nothing. I came from the federal system and I came home with a sweatsuit and some paper in a bag, but I was determined I would not go back. And I went through all the tears of reentry. I started, thank God, the Prince Society as a part-time case manager and I work my way determined not to look back to where I am today. And I use my life story going back into the prisons and encouraging every sister that I see sitting behind those razor wire fences. If it could happen to me, it could happen for you. Just know that you don't want to go back. Connecting with, the, with, with Women's Way has given me a voice that I've always wanted. They've uh, uh, allowed me to relive, retell my story so that people who are sitting in this audience today, and I'm, we're going to push, like Monique said, we're going to take our stories to the streets because we need to break the stigma. One of the games that I'd love to play from a reentry perspective is what's my line. Look at every woman that is on this panel today. We have a doctor. We have a woman with about 65 degrees in, in, in her master's program. We have women who are writing books. We have women who are advocating in Harrisburg. We have myself. So when you think there's a stigma, we, ain't, we don't have no stigma. Stop judging us based on what you think you know about us. That's part of my advocacy also. And I'm grateful that United Way, I mean, I'm sorry, Women's Way has given me a voice to take this out to the world. May I add something to you? Yes. I, just, I just wanted to say one, one thing, and I really appreciate that, Ms. Pam. What came to my heart was those that's closest to the problem is further from the resource, that those closest to the problem is closest to the solution, but further from the resources and the supports that's needed. And I think this is the theme and the the, the core of what woman woman's way, you know, really walked it like they talked it with bringing us together and figuring out what we needed and giving us the support. And I just, I just want to say thank y'all because in all the time that I've been home, I never had this experience to intergenerationally talk 
one-on-one -on -one with the people that I've known that paved the way. And as we stand on the shoulders of giants, try to help generations to come, um, not go through what we go through. And yes, go, I'm, I'm gonna apologize, go ahead, Sappho, but I just really wanted to say I appreciate every woman that participated in this fellowship. This was weeks that y'all, and days and times, that y'all really, you know, it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to write it down so people can learn about it and not have to re-experience it. And I thank y'all for for y'all courage um, to, to to tell y'all story and, and, and to move forward and advocating for solutions and not focusing on just the problem or falling into that category of being a stigma. Go ahead, Seppo. Yeah, I wanted to try to add in on what Ms. Pan was saying, because when we talk about like, you know, connecting and finding your tribe, you know, um, Diane Coleman has been boots on the ground from the day one when she came in. And then she figured out like, you know, how can I get a tribe that can really reach the masses and the minority of women? And and I've been with Women's Way from the time Diane got, got hired. And I remember that... Um, Reverend Michelle, Dr. Reverend Michelle had introduced me to Diane Coleman. You know, um, don't get mad at Michelle, Diane, but you know, um, it's really about connecting to your tribe. We come from an ideology as as brown, black and brown women that um we've got a disconnect in relationships with things happening the way that they are now. We need one another. We gotta move past all this stuff and really you know, and really grow, like, and bond together. And that's what this year has given us, a sisterhood in a whole nother light. You know, I watched Vicky get her doctors here. I was so honored. Like, even when she says it, you know what I'm saying, Miss Pam? I get so, I get chills just thinking about it. You know what I mean? School was a safe space for me. You know, um, and I had to go there because I got so many felonies under my jacket that I couldn't have gotten a job that would have paid my way of living, my my lifestyle without it. So, you know, I'm an international psychology ABD at this point, but I'm I'm on Vicky's heels. Vicky, a doctor. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I mean, y'all all are doing such amazing things that me, myself, at my age, I'm learning and I just appreciate y'all for persevering through and having a resilience to show us that where we start at is not where we have to end. And Jamila <laughs> Harris, I um, understand it's a book that you would like to talk about that possibly can connect our audience um, further in on the work that you do, but also to get a better understanding. And I really encourage y'all, let's listen to this podcast together. Let's host group sessions. Let's, you know, um, do trainings within our work facilities to really hear from the women that we want to help. Let's watch this podcast together. Let, let's this not this webinar be the last time that we get together. Let's host some type of training where we can bring these women in and we, uh, us together, and we can listen to this podcast and we can really put pen to paper that you would like to say in addition um, about the book. No, thank you, Tay. Just that it's a, it, it is a two-part book series. It is available on Amazon. It actually dwells further into my personal story, as well as the reasons why the uh, crossover system should be abolished. It talks about the evolution of the criminal justice system and how it unfairly targets, punishes, and incarcerates individuals from marginalized communities. And it also reimagines and a response to crime that incorporates restorative, which is community, and transformative, which is evolving or going to the problem of the individual that caused them to uh, end up in the justice system. It reimagines uh, punishment approaches that uses restorative and transformative uh, approaches opposed to just simply incarcerating minorities over and over and over again. Thank you. It's available on Amazon and I included the link in the chat. Thank you so much, uh, Jamila. I appreciate that. And we all are definitely going to take a look. I'm about to 
<laughs> download that now. If y'all haven't, please check it out. Um, and I want to talk about criminalized survivors for a second. I know uh Miss Pam uh spoke in her episode. Once you we all sit down and we listen, it's a lot of individuals, particularly women of color, um, queer identifying that's sitting in jail, life without parole, because one, they couldn't afford to purchase their freedom. And two, they was just trying to protect themselves from their abuser, right? And as we see the decline, the decline in men coming home, we see the incline in women being arrested. I was wondering, how can we provide healing and hope for those that's inside, Ms. Vicky? And, and, and then also, how can we advocate on the outside for young women um, that may have been sex trafficked or have been abused by their partner that did the measures that they had to do in order to protect themselves. How do we begin that self-healing to, to then come home and provide that community healing that we need, that Women's Way is providing this space for us to talk about these conversations that's not often talked about when it comes to re-entry, in particular with women? Ms. Vicki and Angie? Hi. So... That was a lot. <laughs> and I want to just be able to say thank you to all of the fellows here today that are sharing. And every time I hear each portion of the stories and the experience of each of my fellows, uh, my heart grows so much more fonder for each and every one of them. Um, I focus a lot on healing because the trauma, if I stay there, it holds me down. And so one of the things that I, I encourage others to do is to um, Kill yourself. And it does not mean that as you're healing yourself, you won't experience more trauma, but it does mean that you won't become a repository for negative things. And if you have a great mindset, your mindset will then help you get to the next thing that you want to do. And so for part of my life, I was in foster care and placement. What that looked like was being raped. Um, what being in foster care and placement looked like was being an individual or a young woman taking care of myself. So going back to one of the other questions was, you know, how did you get involved into the gender wealth gap? Like Ivy, I was born into it. Like so many other urban individuals, like so many other people coming from poverty or even middle class, um, we, we experience this, this gender wealth gap more directly in our homes and in our communities. And then when we come to a sense of consciousness, we experience in our professional careers and our lives as we forward forward. So being a felon was the biggest issue for me. And that is what I had to heal from. But once I did the internal healing from that, um, which was a lot because why I needed to heal, I felt like I let my brother down. My brother stood up for me. My brother got locked up. He got sentenced to 10 and a half to 20 years while I got sentenced to 12 to 24. So I needed to heal from all the things that happened in the past and all of the weight that I was putting on my shoulders. But in the midst of all of that, I still had to live. I was now a teen mom, a single mom. And how can I get by if I'm angry? And if, if that anger isn't dispersed into a space where it's gonna benefit me positively, I'm gonna be back behind those walls, right? And so that was the whole purpose of me, again, just wanting to re-incentivize the healing for myself. And the incentive was this, this wonderful opportunity right here in this moment, because I had no idea what was to come when I started healing. And healing included education, it, is, it included spiritual connections, it included socializing with others that had similarities like my own. And once I began that, that process, all of this amazing things start happening. It was just noted this, this year I um, became a doctor. That was um, by the grace of God throughout all of the works and steps that um, I had begun to put in place to be in spaces just like this. But if I hadn't healed myself and let that energy, that negative anger energy be directed towards something that would benefit me, I wouldn't have this opportunity. So that's one of the things that I advocate for, one of the things that I promote, and I want to inspire others to be able to do is to heal themselves so that they can be their best selves. Confidence is not a look, it's a feeling. And I feel confident about who I am as I step into my life. Um, this year, I also got my pardon, which I had been working for 20 years to get. Um, thank you so much. And this was the third time 
that I had applied this last time. The process is three to five years. Mm -hmm. And so most time, oftentimes, um, there are more men that get the expungement or the part and that they even apply for it because most oftentimes females don't think that they're going to be able to do it because they've been so defeated throughout the processes that they've dealt with in the incarceration system. I continued to forge on. I didn't have a lawyer. I did it all myself. Each process was damaging to my, to my psyche and to my ego. But again, it was through the faith and through the work, believing that through this healing, that I would have opportunities to be able to change somebody else's life. Because once I identified that I wanted to change my life, that work had already begun. But now is how can I then transcend that to others so that they can begin to do the work to change their lives. And again, this, this panel of women, females, individuals that I'm able to join, I am just, I'm so proud and so happy, you know, and it's not about resumes with us. It's about the work because all of these individuals on this panel is out here doing the work. And so I don't want my resume to precede me. I want the work to precede me. And so I want to, again, to say thank you to all of that's on this panel today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Victoria. I really appreciate it. And I mean, I know you inspire me personally, but I'm pretty sure that you inspire so many others that is listening to the podcast that can actually take heed and 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 need this as a you know I thought about it when I was away. I can't give up because I know there's a little girl somewhere counting on me to show them that you can get it through, right? And um, you can make it through as long as we just work together, as long as we just make sure that we don't conform to those negative that's who we need and what we deserve to thrive not just survive right and so that we can make the next generation um feel like they can thrive as um miss angie you being the youngest and one of the only members that hasn't experienced incarceration yourself and i'm gonna try to slow down because i'm nervous too right you know you know but this is something that's passionate like I'm just I'm so passionate about this uh, and I'm just so grateful to be a part of this experience in, in both of us with y'all. I want to know, you know, from you, what has the healing experience uh, been like for you? Um, what, what What's your experience like working with the fellowship alongside other women that has been incarcerated that may be much older than you? And um. What have you, uh, like, how has that impacted your leadership? And um, what things have you taken away from this that you would like to bring to your community to help them move forward as well? Yeah, so thank you for the question. Um, I think being a part of this cohort, um, one of my main objectives was learning as much as I could from the fellows. And I feel like just learning from them and learning to dismantle my own biases and seeing like how powerful these women are, how blessed I was to be in this cohort with them was healing in itself because um, one of my family members was incarcerated. Um, and it was a very, you know, complex case. And I was still trying to heal from that um, when I went into the fellowship. But I think just, you know, being in this space and just learning as much as I did was very nurturing and healing. And again, I'm just, I'm grateful to be here, like you said, too. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angie. Is there anything that you think that the generations to come or young girls um, that's in particular that maybe going through hard times can learn from some of the fellows or women that's coming home that might help them not steer in the wrong direction or feel like they're alone. That what that 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 sense of camaraderie that a uh, woman's way created like that can help them. Yes. Um. So this leads me to think back. Um, about like the quote you said in the beginning, you said, um, if someone doesn't give you a seat at the table, you bring a folding chair and you like, 
you know, place it nearby. And so I just feel like these women are really like the embodiment of that. And so them like showing up, setting an example, people listening to the podcast, people sharing the podcast will ultimately create change. And I agree with you, like we need to have more trainings. Um, we need to have like listening groups. We need more podcasts like this one to be elevated in the media and Thank you, Angie, and thank all the panelists for <laughs> um, my nervousness, but most importantly, um, thank you all for having the courage um, to tell your story so that other people won't um, repeat the same negative stereotype that they think is happening within our communities when it comes to black and brown affected by incarceration, right? Um, like Angie just um stated, it's healing in a process. It's all about restorative justice and making sure that we come together as a community and don't um fight against each other that's gonna that's gonna create more adversity and, and spread us further apart. And I think that William Way did a a, a woman's way did a amazing job of making sure that they got to the root of um the community and making sure that people was represented through all frames of life and that their stories was being told and highlighted in a positive way to create the change that we need for the future. Um, please again if there's anything that people you know would like to share with the audience or there's questions that the audience have um please drop it in the chat but what is your call to action i guess that's my my final question what can help women come home in particular um, in particular to the wealth gap, what can be done you know, to get funded, making sure that um, women that come home get gate money so that they can not deal with the barriers of finding housing and, and, and being formally incarcerated? What, what do y'all need or do y'all feel as though um, that y'all didn't get that would be helpful for women coming home and, and closing this, in, in, this gender wealth gap as far as trainings, grant writing, uh, more amplifying stories, um, just being more inclusive in 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 the the meat of the work and and changing laws and things like that. Like what 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 would y'all like to see and what's y'all call to action? I'd like to go first. Um, I think the biggest thing for me is having like a, a safe space coming home and landing, like trauma trauma and resilience spaces, and also being mindful of um like gender responsive approaches, you know, what's specific to the individual that you're addressing, you know, um, and also like my call to action is absolutely to uh, amend the policy and standards around second chance hires. You know, one of my sisters mentioned earlier, you know, we are employable, we're excellent workers, you know, and we want to work, we want just a chance and we need that support, you know, and um, it means a lot. It means a lot. So I think for me, that was my biggest my biggest call to action at this point is giving us a chance so we don't have the stresses of not being able to pay back the fines and fees, being homeless, not being able to rebuild those relationships with our children because that was that in and of itself is another level of trauma, you know, because we caused a lot of harm to our families while incarcerated. You know, for me, I did. And um, that every day looks like healing. How I speak, how I listen to them, and, and the relationships that I, you know, am very intentional on mending, even after being home 20 years, you know. Um, Ivy. So, Ms. Ivy, is there anything, Um, because I know that there's so much wealth in what y'all talked about in a podcast that needs to be heard. Is there a call to action that y'all have? in regards to this programming or programming that's happening around mobilizing women um, to move forward and close this gender gap that you would like the audience to hear about? My call to action is and will always be to address the language in the 13th Amendment that basically says, if you're incarcerated, you're a slave. You are treated like a slave, you are paid like a slave, 
and you feel like a slave. And then feeling like a slave, that impacts your self-esteem. So when you leave, you have to put yourself back together. You have to heal from that trauma that Sappho just talked about. That's the, my first call to action. My second call of action would be su to support the Sunset Parole Bill, which would allow long-term offenders like myself, I will not be off of parole till 2038. Until 2038, my life will be looked like a series of barriers. Yet I am a two-time senatorial award winner. I'm a Malika Aziz award winner for anti-violence and community activism. I am no longer a criminal because I sought that healing. I, I built the community, I found the community, so I was able to heal. So why am I still being charged and supervised? So those would be my two calls for action. Um, one of my calls and I want to pass it also to Ms. K. Oh, oh. Dr. Penn, no, I wasn't trying to. Um, I'm sorry, Ms. Penn. Please go ahead. No, 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 no. That's okay. That's quite all right. Um, I was just going to say one of my calls to action is something that we touched on a little bit here is that actually having legislation enacted across the country to increase the wages that are paid to us while we're behind the people's rewards. <laughs> 19 cents. In 50, the maximum being 50 cents, it doesn't work anywhere in the world. You know, but when you go behind the walls, you could work for a federal organization or whatever it is, and they won't pay you anything more than 50 cents an hour. I while the prices of uh, items that you have now? to purchase, while the prices of the items you have to purchase, exactly, and your pay does not. Who, okay. who works for 50 cents an hour? So, I mean, I think legislation needs to be passed across the board, across the country, to increase the wages that are paid behind the walls. And one of my second calls to action would be having every staffer, especially the social workers, the, the COs, the everybody that works in a, in a jail, a prison, or penitentiary, that they become trauma-informed and restorative justice trained. I'm pushing for that legislation. They mm -hmm. must. Go yeah. trauma-informed training and restorative justice training, every institution of incarceration across the country. Those are my two calls to act. Thank you so much, Dr. Pam. I mean, Ms. Pam, I really appreciate that. And the 13th Amendment is something that all of us are, are none is working on. And please, if people have mm -hmm. heard of a majority of the people that's providing assistance for our loved ones in jail are welfare recipients. So we're trying to take care of each other when people in jail can't even take care of their families at home, in particular women. Um, we hear about what are y'all calls to actions as we have the voice, I mean, the, the air of the community right now. What do you need? directly to happen, uh, Victoria and uh, Miss Monique. I'm going to jump in real fast, you guys. So my call to action is to make sure that we get a full education for individuals in the incarceration system. And something that was taken out, it was to, I think, to undermine the growth of inmates. So as they prepare themselves for the transition. So one of the things that I want to advocate for is that they reinstate educational practices and services inside the school system, not just supplemental actual degrees. They used to allow to be able to get a, a college degree in, in incarceration system that has been taken away. So mm -hmm. that is my call to action. And I do that not only through this, I do it through the work that I do in community, through Victoria Urban Outreach Tutoring Service. And I want to thank you guys so much for allowing me to share and again, being a part of this. Thank you. How about Miss Monique? Um, what's your call to action? All right, what up here? Hi. Uh, Miss Jamila, what's your call to action? Thank you. Thank you, I'd say my call to action is to, the first is to uh, decriminalize individuals who show the inability to pay off their fines, fees, and restitution. 
I was reprobated for 10 more years because I didn't satisfy that debt that the justice system increased four times more than what I actually owed. And in the state of Pennsylvania, they are allowed to criminalize you as a collection tactic. So a lot of my peers have similar experiences where they completed their incarceration time and they completed their community supervision, but then long and behold, receives a letter that says, you still owe us and now we're gonna uh, recriminalize you uh, or hold you with one handcuff while you make your payments to us. So we have to change that. You shouldn't have to be threatened with uh, uh, going back to jail once you've completed your time. So basically you should not be uh, criminalized because you're poor. So we need to change that language, find some other collection tactic. And the second is a lot of these women, a couple of these women worked with us and you did Latanya on diversionary alternatives for uh, mothers opposed to incarceration. Because when you incarcerate a mother, you're also punishing her children. And, ch and that is one of the greatest risk factors for juvenile delinquency. So when you have these neighborhoods where you got teenagers not being uh, supervised and committing crimes, a lot of it has to do with their parent is not even you know, they're, they're incarcerated. So diversionary alternatives opposed to incarcerating mothers, uh, we are examples, and I love Vicki's story of how the foster system does not work, but we are examples of what it looks like when it does work and we get doctorates and we have our own companies and we have our own nonprofits and we're writing books. This is an example of transformative restorative justice. These approaches are more successful than let's just throw the mother in the jail. And that's that. That's just putting the problem under the rug. It's, and it's creating a greater problem because you left behind her children. And um, we're showing that it works. Thank you. Angie or Monique? Yeah, so my call to action is to be an avid advocate. So I'm just going to give some examples. Um, one is advocating for reform. Um, to do that, right after this webinar, you can connect with Ivy. Um, another one is advocating for things that reduce recidivism, one being mother-infant bonding programs in the state of Pennsylvania. Um, as well as promoting more educational opportunities that also reduces recidivism. Um, and ultimately, also advocating for reproductive freedom in the carceral system, um, whether that be providing a plethora of menstrual products or, and like quality menstrual products and prenatal and postnatal care for those incarcerated women who are pregnant. Thank you, Angie. I appreciate that. Thank you, everyone. Um, Miss Kelly, if, um, Ms. Monique, I'm not sure if you wanted to uh, say anything in regards to your call of action. I may have missed something, but I just want to say my call of action is to hear these stories. Listen to this podcast. Share them with your loved ones through November Thanksgiving. Um, please, I keep. I think I got a lag over here, so I'm not trying to cut you off. If you want to jump in? Please do. Okay, I think your I think her uh, mic is muted. Programs like this that's going to strengthen women, give us the courage uh, to move forward and um, understand the wealth gap and bell disparity and the in their home as well as mothers that serve in time is something important to to reach out and and get a better understanding on. Um, Miss Monique, are you please say that you unmuted? Can you talk? She is not. Okay. Well, before we leave, um, I just but, would, you know, know, there are, there is a Dignity Act that's going on. You got, you want now? Oh, yeah. 
Right. Um, before we leave, I just really wanted to give a real special shout out to to uh, Love Us Now Media. They they oh. absolutely birthed this baby. I was trying. <laughs> They were in there with us throughout the whole well, year, teaching us and guiding us and supporting us and putting up with our good days, bad days, and indifferent days. You know what I mean? And and I, I really, 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 truly am grateful. It takes a village. And the work has just begun to plant the seeds. There were so many questions that were unanswered inside the comments. And we kind of got off, but we made it work. That's what we do. We figured it out. I was over here holding my head. You know what I mean? So, hey, and then we, it's thank God for my sisters because I was like, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. But <laughs> that's who we are, though. That's who we are. We have a bunch of resilience. It's nice. And I'd love for us to take it and do a storytelling at community college or somewhere in the city. And, and you know, we we in it. We here for it. And I think we need to have these conversations with young folks we're older folks, like throughout the city. I think we need to do a panel discussion. And I think we just really need to do individually and just really have a conversation with folks. Like, what can we do different? We're in a situation where we got to create systems that's going to work for us. You understand? Whatever's going on, we got to create systems that's going to work for us. So, you know, I'm here for it. I love you all. And I thank you all, each and every one of you. I'm sure, Kelly, you want to close this out. Absolutely. Let's see here. Make sure everyone can see this. And thank you um, so much. There we go. Thank you, Sappho, for that. And um, also thank you, uh, Latanya. I know I had to drop with a little bit of internet issues. Listen, Mercury is in retrograde, I think, because the tech was just not on our side tonight. Um, so we want to say Thank you for uh, your patience and your grace to all of us as we were navigating all of that. Big thank you to um, our panelists, our Change the Narrative fellows. Um, we were so excited to share their clips with you because they um, told their stories in such a full way about um, their lives pre-incarceration while they were inside and, and what happened when they came out. And we think it's so important um, to highlight uh, the strategies of exploitation and extraction that took wealth from them, but also the ways in which they were able to center healing, uh, center um, building a, a new life for themselves, for their families and communities. And we really think the example that they set in the podcast is one that we want to learn from. So um, we invite everyone to listen to our podcast. The link is in the chat. We will also email the link to the clips that we wanted to share tonight along with the podcast and a listening guide. So uh, as Sappho mentioned, if you are wanting to continue these conversations in your own communities, the fellows are available um, to help support those conversations and the listening guide is there as a resource for you um, to generate more conversation. And there's also a resource guide if you just want to know more about this topic. Um, so check out your emails for all of those links that are coming to you. Um, and just a note for changing the narrative fellowship, we're excited to transition our fellows program um, into the Changing the Narrative Speakers Bureau, which will feature speakers from all four cohorts of fellows serving as advocates, as public speakers, and social change warriors. Um, so there'll be more opportunities for, for you to hear from fellows from this cohort and all of our cohorts in the coming year. Um, finally, we will return in January for the next series of the Closing the Gender Wealth Gap uh, webinar. You'll see the topics listed here. We'll spend time learning about pathways and solutions that will get us to not only closing the gender wealth gap, uh, but move us toward the economic liberation that we all deserve. The series is virtual, it's ongoing, and we always welcome new friends to learn on the journey alongside us. So thank you everyone for joining us this evening um, and we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks everyone. <laughs>